my great pleasure to welcome you to the Oxford University Ideas Lab. My name is Andrew Hamilton. I am the Vice Chancellor of Oxford University. And today we are going to be focusing on the topic in today's hyper-connected world, what collaborative models to solve global issues are emerging? Hyperconnectivity in a, in in a in a in a large and a diverse world. Now, what institution could be better to discuss this than Oxford University? For 900 years, as many of you know, Oxford University, in its very devolved collegiate structure has nonetheless been a whole that is much greater than the sum of the parts. A whole that has had an impact on the world of education, on the world of research, on the world of scholarship, of leadership, of many different aspects of society. It has done so through working out effective ways of collaboration. And while that has a historical context in the past 900 years, it is very relevant for the future and the future contributions that Oxford University and its academics and students will make to the world in the next 900 years. And I am delighted that today we will have contributions from two of the very new parts of Oxford University the Oxford Martin School, an interdisciplinary school focused on major problems of the 21st century, and also the Blavatnik School of Government, a new school announced last year, first students arriving this coming September, a very exciting initiative where we will be focusing a tradition of training leaders but now focusing on very relevant global questions of governance and public policy. So it's a great delight to welcome all of you to the Oxford Ideas Lab. It's also a delight to hand over to Hiro Takeuchi, who's going to be our facilitator today. Thank you. Thank you. Great. <laughs> welcome to the uh, Ideas Lab. Um, you're probably wondering, what is a Japanese with an American accent <laughs> doing in front of this audience? Uh, but the uh, Ideas Lab uh, came from a Japanese onomatopoeia, pechakucha, which is kind of chit-chat. And so this is a very different format than the ones that you're used to with the panelists up on stage with the facilitator. Uh, how many of you have been to an ideas lab in the past? Oh, so maybe only half. Let me just explain. Um, this is going to be a very different flow uh, than the usual, the panelists uh, talking. Uh, and it has three very uh, strong impact. First, it's probably very difficult on the speakers because they have to limit their presentation to 15 slides and only 20 seconds per slide. And they cannot be words, they have to be visuals. So how are they going to explain the difficult notion of hyperconnectivity without words? So it's a big challenge for them. Number two, it's a lot easier job for the facilitator. If you recall one of those panelists, the panelists go on forever, right? <laughs> they are limited to 15 slides and 20 seconds per slide. So it's a lot easier on the facilitator. Uh, thank goodness I'm, I'm here with you. And the third is you're going to be the participants. So it's not only the Oxford people presenting that is going to bring out the outcome uh, after their presentations, we're going to break out into five sessions, and you can choose which one by your feet. Uh, and we're going to have a discussion based on the topic that excites you the most. And we'll have a report out at the end, so that we'll learn from all the others. There's a very interactive, dynamic session. So I'm glad you're here, and I'm going to introduce you yeah, to introduce the five speakers, including yourself. Please, Professor Golden. 
Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Ian Golden, the director of the Oxford Martin School, and I have an enormous pleasure of introducing the colleagues that are going to present uh, the ideas around hyperconnectivity, how it can be harvested, and how we can mitigate the risks associated with it. First, you'll hear from Professor Angela McLean, who is the director of the Oxford Martin School Institute of Emerging Infections. Then you'll hear from Felix Reed Sokas, who is the director of our program on complexity. Following him will be Chris Lintot, who directs our program on computational cosmology, and he'll explain why they can help us solve the problems of the 21st century. And he'll be followed by Professor Nairi Woods, who's the Dean of the New Blavatnik School that the Vice Chancellor introduced. So without further ado, let's begin uh, with complexity as I see it. The world has seen absolutely fundamental changes over the last 20 years. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there's been <coughs> political opening, economic opening, and technological opening around the world. It's a fundamentally different world to the previous world that existed. And this has brought immense opportunity. It's the best time to be alive. It's certainly the best time to be young. The opportunities for creativity are greater. And there are more of us. Two billion people living in close proximity, half of us urbanized, and all of us virtually, virtually connected now. So we share ideas, we share good things, and we can harvest these. We can use them to solve the problems of the 21st century. We can eradicate poverty and disease in our lifetimes. This is the potential of hyperconnectivity. It's the upside of globalization. People around the world are seeing this, how to solve problems in their lives, and also how they can create better lives. So it can be used as a development tool, and it can be used in many, many other ways. But combined with the technologies which just allow us to do things, we have most extraordinary potential. This fiber optic cable from Nairobi is faster than that going into Canary Wharf, 1.2 terabytes a second, and doubling in speed every year in its capacity. So the technologies are there, but we need to make sure they're used for good. All of them can be used for bad as well. So as we upload our information, and this is a visual of the uploading from Twitter and other feeds in Europe, you see people wanting to connect, wanting to share. We can use this technology to share emotion, to share ideas, and to share our common humanity. The question is, are we able to do it in a way that solves our problems? And certainly what we're able to do is leapfrog in terms of our educational potential. Education is the key because it's what brings people into literacy about the issues. These people together will solve the problems of the world. 500 million newly educated people over the last 10 years and 700 million in the next. In our plants for the 21st century group in Oxford, we're working on new ways of dealing with water stress, climate stress, to solve the problems of plants for poor people around the world, nutrition and stress around them. These technologies are beginning to exist. They will leapfrog as the number of people focused on this join hands, think together, and of course become connected. So this is a resilient and very strong potential in globalization. We've become bound up with each other in a way that brings immense good. The challenge is not to fall apart. The challenge is to ensure that this is used in a positive way. The dangers of falling apart are very, very significant. <coughs> Hyperconnectivity also leads to systemic risk. The danger is cascading risk that when we open our borders and connect, we become more vulnerable. If this happens, people will begin to close the doors on connectivity. They'll become xenophobic, protectionist, nationalist, and enter into deglobalization. This is the biggest risk we face. If we can't allow our diversity and our connectedness to bring us together, if we find it too frustrating, we go back to our old ways. Look inwards and don't reach out. We can't allow this to happen. The stakes are too great. It's extremely important that we find ways to manage the downside risks of connectivity while also harvesting the upside. And one of these greatest risks is that many people don't feel that they have benefited from this experience. Inequality has grown in the process of globalization. And as this grows, people feel that there's nothing in it for them. So inclusive globalization is vital. Ensuring that we can provide jobs, sustainable livelihoods is vital. One thing is sure, there's no going back. We cannot reverse the clock. To imagine a deglobalized world as being better is a romantic notion that won't help people in poverty. It won't solve the problems. And you can't actually close 
your doors, as Angela will show. The world is too connected. We have to use this connectivity in new ways. We also have to understand that the market will not provide the answers. This is the tuna being sold for $750,000 in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago. The market will price up scarce resources and ration in that way until there are no tuna left. And the same with other scarce resources where there's a market for them. But in most areas, they're not. So we need to build the bridges, like this bridge between Copenhagen and Sweden. Robust, well-designed, and an aim to withstand the storms of globalization. We can do it. We are able to muster our intensive knowledge to this purpose. But it's a collective ideal that we need to focus on. So the question that we need to address is how do we join hands? How do we ensure that this collective wisdom is used to build, to share ideas, and to become even more ingenious as we have always been. Unless we're able to do so, there's a real risk that we're going to find that this period of hyperconnectivity is seen in history as a period of hyper-risk. So the question I have, and I'd like to discuss with you afterwards, is how do we manage the systemic risk associated with globalization? Thank you. Any questions uh, before we move on to the next speaker? The intent here is to just raise questions and we're not going to have the speaker answer any of them because he's going to wait until uh, he's at the very end there to address the question how can, uh, can systemic risk be limited? But any uh, questions to the speaker right now? Yeah, we'll take them. Um, I, I thought it was very good but the comment that markets um, I think he's, sorry, markets will not try and provide answers. In terms of fish, it's easy. You can have licenses for fish. So markets have the answers to all of this if, uh, if you actually do. Oh, yeah, that's a very good answer. We will raise that issue over there. That's a very interesting. Any other uh, clarifying questions? Yes, please. <coughs> Just to draw on that point, the market will do it, assuming that you've got an effective government that's going to allocate licenses fairly without corruption. No, I agree. I agree with that. I take that. This is the kind of collaboration we'll be having over there uh, at the corner. So that's uh, great. You've uh, kicked it off in the right uh, mode. So can I now turn to Angela, please? <coughs> In the spring of 2001, a huge outbreak of problem mouth disease arose in the United Kingdom. It's the disease of sheep and cattle and pigs. It's very, very infectious, and the way it's dealt with is to kill the infected animals. Uh, the first cases were actually right at the beginning of February, but it wasn't discovered until the 20th of February. So it circulated in the UK for three weeks without being known about. And that just happens to be a time of year in the United Kingdom when sheep trade <coughs> like nobody's business. You could say a time of hyperconnectivity of the sheep population in the UK. So there were 79 infected farms before we even knew about this. And because of that, because of that hyperconnectivity, a local outbreak became a national disaster. Then, in the spring of 2003, a novel human infection was circulating in China. Uh, it caused a severe acute respiratory disease. It was called SARS. And at the same time the infection, was circulating, news about this infectious disease was circulating on an informal internet network called ProMedMail. In fact, the news of SARS broke on ProMedMail before it was initially acknowledged. And in fact, so this network broke the secret of SARS. Um, and as you can see, it was fundamentally just gossip. Uh, that epidemic ca caused Dirk Brockman to ask a very interesting question. Can I use the global aviation network to explain how SARS spread around the world? Uh, this map here is seats per week connecting the 500 largest international airports in the world. And the answer to Dirk's question is yes. His very simple, elegant model that said, can I predict how many SARS cases there would be as a function simply of um, airline networks originating out of Hong Kong? And the top is what actually happened, and the bottom is what you uh, get from that very simple model. I think in the spring of 2009, in the spring of 2009, a new influenza was circulating in Mexico. And this time, this was picked up by a different network, the Global Influenza Surveillance Network. Very early on in the infection, picked up that this was a new influenza that was actually detected in American children. 
And once again, uh, it's spread around the world, mostly on the global aviation network. It's a different mathematical model uh, that illustrates that the date at which swan <coughs> flu arrived uh, in the country was extremely well predicted uh, by the global aviation network. So I've shown you three examples where connectivity through trade or through travel is a great way to spread infection, and that raises the very obvious question, well, can we protect ourselves with quarantine? If you look back to the South Pacific in 1918, the answer was yes. Four countries that implemented very strict maritime quarantine were able to hold off the 1918 flu pandemic <coughs> for months. But the countries that imposed quarantine, but not very strictly, had no impact at all. And that's actually exactly what we'd expect from a theory that tells us that if quarantine is going to work, it has to be more or less absolute. Now, back in 1918, it was possible to impose a strict maritime quarantine because there wasn't any airline travel, basically. This is retail passenger kilometers, a measure of how far people are traveling by air. And as you can see, it's grown exponentially since then. And there are really very, very few parts of the world now who are either able or can afford to sh shut themselves off in the absolute manner that would be required to effectively keep an infectious disease out of these sorts that are spread so easily. Uh, this particular map uh, is of global, the global airline network, color-coded by how fast you can get from one place to another. <coughs> However, it's, the travel networks are not the only networks at play. I already told you about the influenza surveillance network. This is an active <coughs> network that's working all the time to protect our health, partly to protect new infections, uh, sort of new types of influenza, but actually, it's also this network that figured out what SARS was. Um, other networks of uh, scientific collaboration are also in place and growing. This is uh, substantial collaborations between pairs of countries uh, in the years 2004 to 2008. So, on the one hand, we have growing networks of travel and trade that are great ways to spread infection. And on the other hand, we have growing networks of information um, and research. So you can look at these hands and you can see it two ways. On the one hand, oh no, we know hands are a great way to spread infectious diseases. Are these people all just infecting each other? Or are these healthy hands? Are these people actually connected together, sharing information in order to combat information, uh, no, infection? And that brings me to my question, which is, can sharing information stop pandemics? Thank you. <coughs> Comments, questions on pandemics? So what happened? Yeah. So what happened after the first few months in the South Pacific? No answers. You have to attend her session, which is going to be right there. Uh, if you want the answer for that. <laughs> Other uh, comments, questions? Yes. So you put from your presentation that we can also think of the world as uh, a body now, which has its, uh, you know systems like you know, your circulatory system, immune system, all systems which are body-wide, where both the invading viruses and bacteria and the solution provided by the body are competing both on a hyper-connected basis. Mm. Okay, you probably have an answer for that. Others? Well, we'll uh, move on to the next presentation by Felix, uh, please. You're looking at a rather unusual supply network. It's been honed by millions of years of evolution to be resilient to changes in its environment. This image from my colleague Mark Fricker's lab in Oxford shows fungal mycelia and how nutrients in it flow. Here, on the other hand, we see the assembly of cars, part of a production system which involves many, many different firms. And this is probably what we would more typically think of when we talk of a supply chain. Of course, in this case, rather than trial and error, the supply chain has been designed by careful deliberation and planning. So one question is, what sorts of general principles could we think of when we try to design such a system? If we're driven entirely by efficiency, we would probably end up with something like this. A hierarchy where coordination costs are minimized, where labor is carefully divided, 
and where specialization can arrange, arise in different nodes. But there is a problem. And this image here of the uh, nuclear power plants that were damaged at Fukushima raises this problem. Under normal circumstances, a hierarchical network is highly efficient. But when normal operations start to break down, it is dangerously fragile. Here we see a picture of a real supply chain, something we know remarkably little about. This is a map that's been produced by my group in Oxford, and it shows the thousands of firms that work together with Toyota in producing cars. At the center, you see Toyota, and importantly, and quite contrary to hierarchy, there are many links between uh, suppliers in a tier. What are the implications for resilience? What happens when you get flooding, like the one that you see here in Thailand, where suppliers and whole supply parts were submerged by water? One thing we find from our studies from Toyota is that if there are cooperative links between suppliers, the supply chain is more resilient. Let's look at the supply chain in a different way. Zooming in, we find that there are sub-networks of which this network is composed that reflect different functional needs, for instance, those associated with making engines or headlines. This modular structure, <coughs> interestingly enough, also makes the overall network more resilient. Supply networks, of course, uh, come in many shapes and forms and include the transport networks you see here. Again, the airline, the global airline transport network you see above that you already saw in Angela McLean's presentation, and something very equivalent below for shipping. The question from my point of view is, how do we make such structures resilient? One answer could be supplied from biology. Interestingly enough, it doesn't always require centralized planning or huge del deliberation to create a supply network. Here, a very simple organism has managed to mimic the solution to an urban transport problem. It does so by applying simple rules and finding complex answers. Another supply network delivers power to homes and to businesses. This is an interesting example because it demonstrates that increased connectivity does not always build resilience. The cascades that have led to massive back blackouts of power are a wonderful demonstration of that, maybe not so wonderful if you're subjected to them. Supply networks are not only big networks in their own right, but they're embedded in an increasingly connected world. Here we see on the top the uh, relations between countries and trade imbalances in the 1960s and below in the year 2000. And as you can see, the environment of these relationships has become much more complicated. The same image comes from this picture provided by uh, Ricardo Hausmann, which shows how products in different countries are related and the interconnections between countries that this product relatedness connects. Again, global supply chains need to live in environments like these. A quick reminder, it isn't necessarily the case that we want supply chains to be resilient. Here are trade routes associated with the uh, cocaine tra traffic from West Africa, and clearly here our question is how might we disrupt such a, tra a supply chain? So this is very much more a question along the lines of how might we stop an epidemic? Although the general impact of globalization has been to increase connectivity, at a local level, connections sometimes become more sparse. This is a study that we made in the New York garment industry over 20 years, where you see that the network strongly declines. And the important question is, how can the integrity of the network be preserved? Interestingly enough, the answer to that question is one that also applies to food webs. That's the image that you see here. It turns out that you need to try to do your best to preserve links between highly connected hubs and sparsely connected specialists in order for such a system to actually be preserved. And this applies both to ecology and to industrial networks. All of which leads me to my question, when is connectivity risky? Thank you. Right. Questions, comments uh, to Felix? It was so crystal clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, then we'll move right on. Chris? Thanks. Um, I suppose I better start by explaining why you're about to hear from an astronomer. Um, one of the moves that we see as we move into the 21st century is a shift to the era of big data. And in astrophysics and cosmology, we have some of the largest uh, freely available data sets in the world. We're very keen to share our insights uh, on how to deal with large data and how to understand complex problems with the rest of 
uh, the world. So I'm hoping my slides, oh, that was a bonus piece of this, uh, It wasn't always thus. This is the state of the art from 1850 on, where if you wanted to study the universe, you would spend long hours of a telescope sketching a galaxy, uh, an island universe, and perhaps you'd spend the rest of your career studying a signal object. These days, we don't really get to sketch anymore. We don't even get to go to telescopes anymore. We deal with data sets like this. This is a map of our local universe. Each dot here, a galaxy comprising 100 billion stars. And we can learn a lot about the last 13.7 billion years of history, uh, the universe's history, uh, by decoding this map. The only problem is that as well as dealing with information on this scale, individual galaxies still have a story to tell us. And so as we shift to big data sets, we need to deal not only with the overarching vision, we don't only need to shift our scale up, but we want to deal with the individual units of information as well. In this case, we want to know the shape of the galaxies, because the shape of these two galaxies, which is very different, tells us that their histories are different. Um, turns out that shape is best determined by humans. It's a pattern recognition task. We still have the edge on computers. Uh, and if you have a million galaxies, you better have a lot of humans. We tried giving it to one PhD student. Uh, he threatened to quit. Uh, and so we created a website called Galaxy Zoo and invited hundreds of thousands of people to participate. In the nearly five years since Galaxy Zoo started, we've topped half a million people, contributing 350 million classifications. We have lots of people look at each galaxy, and collectively their results are great. And so I can now deal with a million galaxies with the attention that we used to give to one. Of course, this problem isn't restricted to galaxies. We have people hunting for planets. This is an artist's impression of one of our recent discoveries. This is a planet around a double star. We're beginning to realize there are 100 billion planets in each galaxy, as well as 100 billion stars. And also way beyond astronomy, with projects ranging from uh, transcribing ancient pyrite to this, our latest project, whale.fm, which is a, a project to determine whether whales have regional accents. Because this data deluge, this flood of data, isn't just restricted to astronomers. It's coming to biology, uh, it's coming to many of the topics that you've heard already, it's coming across science. We collect these projects in the umbrella uh, Zooniverse banner. Uh, now, some of you will be thinking, but hang on, what, what are these people, where are these people finding the time? This is a lot of human attention we can see consuming. The large box is the 200 billion hours spent watching television each year by US adults, and Angry Birds contains 16 years of human attention every day. None of you, I'm sure. And so if we can harness that attention, we can create a harmonious uh, vision of a future of collaboration between humans and robots, just as you see here. Because uh, the point is the data, the robots are going to get cleverer. They're going to get better at collecting data. What seems like a large data set today, a million galaxies, will be dwarfed by the, by the data sets of the future. And so what we're building, what we're trying to build, is a set of tools that can allow humans and computers to work together, to allow computers to classify most of the data, to work their way through most of the 100 or so billion galaxies in the universe, but then call for help from humans when needed. Now, in what circumstances will we need help from humans? Well, the killer app that humans have is serendipity. We, we're brilliant at recognizing the unusual. If you give this image to a computer, it will tell you there's a spiral galaxy. If you give this image to a human, they want to know what the green blob is. If you want to know what the green blob is, you can find me later. It's named after Hanny von Arkel, the Dutch school te teacher who discovered it. Even boring objects can be interesting to humans. These are the galaxy zoo peas. These are small green galaxies found in the background of images by a group of non-scientists who found them, classified them, searched for more, uh, and organized a conference on them before talking to any professional scientists. The email I got didn't say, what's the weird thing? It said, we discovered a new class of galaxy, and they had. And so what we have here is a frame of three different ways to ask for help from the crowd. There's the structured question we ask in galaxies in, is this a spiral galaxy? We can process that data set like any other. There's the completely serendipitous one in a million discovery, this is a weird galaxy, what's this? And then there's this collaboration that we enable with tools. What I want to ask is, can we apply this to the pressing problems that we have? Never mind cosmology. We have a climate science project where people are rescuing climate data uh, from 19th and 20th century ships locks, which could be of use, use to the scientists. But how do I turn that crowd? There are 100,000 people who have spent their time typing in what data from weather locks. How do I turn that crowd into a group of people who are able to engage more deeply with climate science, can direct uh, the the future of, of, 
uh, our societies and to deal sensibly with the political problems that something like climate change uh, endangers. And so my question to you all is, what problems can't be crowdsourced? I tend to be an optimist. I hope some of you will come in and throw your hard problems at me. Thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Moving right along, we have uh, Ngari. Nairi. Nairi. Yes. Sorry. Uh, that's the last but not the least. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do are we on? Do I get my little bow? <laughs> yes. Um, so, can we govern globalization? This is the Oxford Rowing Aid winning the Oxford Cambridge Boat Race. This is the race this man won a few years ago. Um, they're, the right people are in the boat, they're rowing in unison, and they're heading in the right direction. Three elements that global governance needs. Is that what we've got when we think about how globalization is being governed? The populations of the world would say no. They're concerned that globalization, as the 2008 crisis showed us, is channeling benefits to a very small number and a small number of countries, but spreading costs right across the world, as the immediate aftermath of the 2008 crisis showed. Can global leaders get in together in groups like the G20 work? Yes. Congress of Vienna, 1814 to 1820s. These leaders got together in the first sort of predecessor of what we now call the G20, and they did come up with a plan for how to stop Europe, Europe's 30 years of war with one another. Talleyrand, Metternich, Castlereagh. Here's another three characters, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, getting together at the end of the Second World War, summitry once again, planning together first steps in what the order that would come after the Second World War would actually look like. Is that what the G20 are doing today? Well. Alas, many would say, this is the G20, they're capsized, they're not, they're not in the boat, they're not running together, and they're not going in a clear direction. We saw that great moment of global cooperation after the 2008 crisis, for a few heavy months. They did cooperate, they created a global growth pact, they all stayed on the same page. And then the Greek crisis occurred, we saw them split into disarray, in Pittsburgh in 2009, the G20 already started looking like this, and to many, this is what the G20 is still looking like today. So the question that I pose to you is, is that because globalization is in some sense ungovernable? No. What governments have done is they themselves have been the agents of globalization. What they've been terrific at doing until now is using global cooperation to create market open rules. Robust rules, rules that make it possible to end up with a globalized financial system, rules which prize open markets, and if countries refuse to, enforcement can be pursued. What's gone wrong with that? What's gone wrong is that the successes have been great, the market opening has been great, but on the other side of the scale, there's been a deficit. And that deficit we've seen highlighted by the financial crisis, which is prudential regulation. The market opening measures have been rule-based. There have been tight rules that can be enforced, but the prudential regulation has been a set of voluntary standards, softly, softly, behind closed doors, unenforceable. And it's that imbalance that G20 leaders now need to address. And the problem with a softly, softly approach, as we showed in this study of eight different sectors, not just the financial services sector, is that it gives private interests three great advantages private information, lobbying those who are making decisions behind closed doors and using discretion in a context where there's no government, there's no clear direction. So what do we need to solve that? First, a spotlight, a open institutions, public watchdogs, robust public monitoring, a spotlight that gives everybody access to information about the risks we're facing globally and about what our public institutions in global cooperation are doing to resolve those risks. Second, we need robust rules, not broken promises. We need the same kind of robust rules that have been used for market opening now to really take seriously public concerns about the downside of globalization. Robust rules that can be monitored and enforced. The third thing we need is the right people in the boat, and we need to manage a transition. This is the G7, yeah, more than seven, they always are. The G7 have been making the rules until now, the obvious comment that power has shifted, yet the G7 is still meeting on their own and coordinating on their own. 
They're doing that alongside the G20. And here are the non-G7 G20 members, the BRICS. So how is it that we can manage this transition? Some would say we've got to make the G20 more inclusive and more participatory and so forth. I would say let's go back to the rowing analogy and make them compete. If the G7 want to keep doing their own thing, the BRICS need to build a much faster boat. They need to row in unison. They need to find a direction of their own. They need, in essence, within the G20 to compete with the G7 and to push the G7 to come up with better directions, faster, and to row better in unison. Eventually, of course, they might all be in the same boat. So thank you very much. And my question is, how can we govern globalization better?